welcome to a conversation that we're going to be having about data, data collection, and how this might work in the field of plastics. My name is Amy Fistone. I am an assistant professor at Gonzaga University, and it is my great pleasure to uh, be an interlocutor here for Eric Schell, who credentials I did not look up in advance. So would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, no, look, uh, uh, let's, let's not pretend we aren't having this conversation in whatever month this is of quarantine, uh, <laughs> based off of a Twitter conversation that uh, was uh, put together at random. So uh, I'm Eric Schell. Uh, I am uh, the, oh gosh, what's the title? I never remember my title, but I work at the Society for Classical uh, Studies. Um, the wizard behind the scenes at the SCS, as I usually yes. describe you to people. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I believe what we ended up with was um, members, gosh, I actually don't know. Uh, communications and member man membership management, that's what it was. Um, but I, I, I get the things that everybody sweeps into the, I don't want to deal with this right now, uh, gutter and uh, happy to do it. Um, I also am, uh, for the credential of why I in particular am speaking about data, I am the person currently kind of leading the SCS on past, our past attempts at data and our future direction towards hopefully better and more useful data. Um, so, and I am, uh, I also have just received my master's at the uh, NYU Steinhardt um, School in uh, Education and Social Policy, uh, which was, oh, thank you. Um, hey, congratulations again. Thank you. I, um, I got a hot eight weeks until that degree comes in, but they told me I got it. So I'm gonna trust them at their word. <laughs> um, and that was like a half, it was like half statistics, half public policy degree. Uh, so I am coming at this from the just barely knows statistics enough to be useful. So excellent. Cheers, to that. cheers indeed. Um, so as a, what, what sort of prompted this conversation in the first place was uh, some conversations being had on Twitter about the need for numbers. And I think we probably can all agree that as compared to some other fields, classics doesn't have good numbers. Classics in the US, but also um, possibly classics outside the US as well. Um, we don't seem to have good data around a lot of, of salient things in terms of, of gender, gender identity, around race especially. Um, and that seems, this is something that comes up in a lot of different conversations about why, why can't we at least have the numbers and then we can use that as a starting point to talk about progress. And so, um, I wanted to maybe just start if there are, are there any particular misconceptions or things that you want to to kind of debunk right off the bat because uh, this came out of a, a you're wishing you could wave a wand and make people understand more than they do about data collection. So are there any before we, we dig into some more specifics, are there any just out the gate misconceptions you want to make sure that we clear up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the first thing I would I would challenge everybody to kind of start doing on the internet in general, but also uh, in their lives is when, when, they, when they say data, I want uh, maybe think really hard, like what specifically they mean when they say data, because that mean, that's a very large umbrella term. That's like a beach umbrella term. And we're looking, we're trying to like narrow that down to like a personal umbrella size. So like when we in this conversation say, um, data, what you described earlier is typically, we're looking at, we're trying to get demographics, right? We're trying to get, um, you know, um, uh, race and ethnicity, we're trying to get education level, we're trying to get uh, age, sometimes when we're doing job stuff, we're trying to get salary, we're trying to get employment status. Uh, there, These are all demographic pieces of information. Uh, and I think what people are imagining uh, is something a little bit more uh, policy focused in terms of data. Like when they say data, they're like, yes, we want the demographics, but we also want those demographics to say something. Uh, and so in order to say something statistically with data, you typically need something to be happening, right? Like if, a, if somebody wants a math course to know if a math course is good, They'll say, we have 10 years of data. And it's these demographic data that we, we want and we're talking about. Um, but there's also, for example, a test score or a teacher evaluation. And then they look at all those, all those numbers and they say, all right, here's where we started the new math course. What changed? 
And we in classics don't really do that very much. We don't typically have like a from on high uh, system or program that we implement and then wait to see if something changes. We, like you said, we want to see what our field looks like. And we want to then be able to take those numbers and do something with them. And that's kind of the other like misconception that I want to get into. And we're going to get into it later, so I won't talk too much about it now. But that data has to answer a question. We got to know what that question is. So um, kind of this idea that we should have numbers uh, is kind of half the question. And in order to effectively get data, we have to have the second half. We want these numbers in order to dot, dot, dot. And that dot, dot, dot has to be like specific. It can't be we need these numbers to end racism. That doesn't exist in terms of like a possibility, uh, especially as the SCS. But like we need these numbers to um, check on the possibility to expand minority scholarship funding. That's a very achievable role, right? So we're going to talk about this more later, so I don't want to get into too much of it now. Um, Another misconception uh, is that data is very easy to get, right? It's like that if only we were doing X, we could have the data that we want and, wait, and everybody could dance around and there could be a Saturnalia all of the time. Um, <laughs> that that is, is the classicist <laughs> end goal for everything. It's just yes. all, all day, every day Saturnalia. Mm -hmm. This is not the position of the yes, yes, position of Eric Shell only personally. Um, that should be our end goal in all classics policy is to end up out of Saturnalia, but you know, um, you can't have everything you want in this world, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but the, the fact that data is easy to get, data is in fact very hard to get, and even the people who make way more than us and bring in more money doing so, um, have a really hard time doing it. So kind of uh, uh, something that we can do kind of throughout the conversation, I hope, is maybe contextualize the difficulties of getting data and maybe realigning our expectations for it. Um, see, yes, we talked about that. Ah, and then the final one that is more conspiracy theory than, than uh, misconception. And I just, I, I get many uh, conspiracy love, love theories. Love a good conspiracy theory. We I'm, could do a I'm whole separate conversation on your top 10 conspiracy theories people pitch to you. There is a year, this is, this is a tangent already, but there is, there's gonna be a few of those, I'm sure. Um, there was a year where I kept a list of, uh, I called the list, the SCS should, dot, dot, dot. And it was basically every time I saw online somebody saying the words, the SCS should, and then complete the sentence, I would write it down. I got about four pages, like big pages of just like sentence after sentence of some absurd things that they think <laughs> that the SCS, I was like, I don't know what you think we're doing in our offices, but it, it ain't that. <laughs> I've assumed um, it's an Illuminati vibe, but. I, hmm, yeah, I really, I, I did a video tour actually of what the SES office looked like uh, very early on when we moved. And that would have really dispelled uh, the Illuminati <laughs> vibe. We are next door to like a ballet fellowship group uh, who has more employees than us. So it's kind of just ballet dancers walking around um, and then us trying to talk about ancient studies in their vicinity. Um, <laughs> But not the misconception I was, I was initially going for, but uh, the idea that SES has data and doesn't share it uh, is something that seems to come up every so often that we are somehow hiding all of these numbers that everybody seems to want and are just like hoarding it for some reason. Um, not the case. Uh, we obviously like, like all nonprofits, we have information that is like financially based or legally based that like I don't even see. Uh, but in terms of like, the placement data, that report's got all the data we get in there. Uh, and if I had more, I'd share it. Um, there's not like a repository of demographic data that we have and we're so embarrassed that we won't share it. Uh, no, we, we know that it would be embarrassing if we had it, but we don't have it. Um, we, we want it as bad as everybody else. So I think those are like my main, my main like most common misconceptions um, about data that I see frequently. This might, this might be a really good place to pivot then towards, um, you, you know, we know it would be embarrassing if we had it, but we don't have it. Uh, yeah. So in terms of, you know, we can start with, because the placement service is one of the, the places most people know you from being the, the face of, of the placement service. Um, and 
there, if I'm remembering correctly, there's an optional survey that people can fill out after. What exactly in terms of what data do we have on that front? And then we can talk about kind of the other places where we might want demographics that we do or don't have. But um, how, what, what do we have? Where does it come from? What might be more useful to have that we don't have just on the, on the placement service type, uh, phase of things? Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess I, I did. I got through my job description without mentioning the placement service, which is usually yeah. like the first thing I throw in there. But <laughs> um, you know, going into quarantine for three months, you kind of forget <laughs> uh, the most basic duties. Um, yeah. So placement service is kind of right now our most consistent vector for gathering information, aside from like people who sign up for membership, which is what we've been doing for 150 years. So. You know, it's a tough, tough order to beat. Um, placement data basically comes in two forms. Uh, if you are, if you sign up for the placement service as a candidate on our website, you fill out some information about yourself. Um, a lot of that information has become optional, and we're going to talk about why later on about the limit with when we talk about limitations. But basically, uh, a lot of internet privacy stuff has come down the pike, uh, particularly in the UK and the EU. But uh, over here more, a little bit more uh, lately. And basically the, uh, our ability to require filling out information like that has been uh, taken away for good privacy reasons, but that does undercut our ability to get that sort of information. That's where you would tell us your institution, um, your sex or gender, if you felt comfortable giving that. Um, and then that, that kind of existed initially because if you're going to the annual meeting, and let's say, for example, um, you have an interview, but I haven't heard from you, uh, try, or your institution was supposed to interview you, but they can't find you. It's like a safety measure, right? Okay. Um, it's our way of saying like, yes, we can contact this candidate and they have not like disappeared or purposefully left this interview. Um, it's also another way of getting a search party or search committees to interview people like they have no excuse to not interview you, right? <laughs> that was kind of the initial formulation of that, um, but it kind of became an opportunity to collect more data that was then turned optional and therefore the numbers went down. The second one is the placement survey that happens um, immediately after the annual meeting. A lot of people have filled it out. Uh, search committees fill it out, candidates, people who are on the placement service but don't necessarily fall into either of those roles. So if you're a department administrator who just wants to see jobs come out, things like that. Right. Um, and that's a second chance to kind of fill out more more, more uh, specific information like age, employment status. Um, and it also gives people the opportunity to perhaps report violations that happen at the, at the annual meeting, that sort of thing. So those are kind of our two main vehicles for placement data. Um, I, like I said, a lot of it is optional and the stuff that isn't optional is dependent on people filling it out, uh, which is something we're gonna talk about a lot throughout the course of this conversation is that at the end of the day, if people don't fill out a thing, we don't have that information. And that's just the end of the, the, end of the conversation. For example, according to our placement survey, um, we haven't had a black candidate in classics on the job market for four years. Um, I personally know that that is, that is factually inaccurate. false. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I was going to say that points to some problems. There, there aren't a ton I, of, of black candidates, but there are some. Uh -huh. There are some, uh, but according to the data, there are none because nobody who uh, identifies uh, as black has filled out the placement survey and then identified their race. They might have I filled out some other parts of the survey and not and left race blank. They might have not filled it out at all. Um, they might identify separately than what perhaps I might think. So there's a lot of explanations, but according to the raw data numbers, we have not had a black candidate in Hot Six, right? So. Autom uh, uh, right, um, like uh, automatically, you start to see where some of this data stuff kind of starts falling apart, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, what kind of, of response rate are you getting from the uh, placement data survey, the, the end of stuff? Uh, end, of, end of the year stuff uh, after the annual meeting is getting pretty good. We usually get about um, high, high 70s, low 80s out mm -hmm. of... Um, I think the candidate count hovers in the two to three hundreds on a normal year. Um, so that's actually, it's a relatively good response rate. It's approaching a third. Um, okay. We get 
a little bit better from the automatically, like the candidate profiles online that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just because um, a candidate profile is required in order to fill in your time slot to be interviewed. Um, right. That's one of the ways that we kind of got more data out of people. Um, since it went optional and since um, when the placement service went free, the number of people who signed up for it actually dropped. Um, so that kind of changed the response rates uh, for that data as well. So the, that response rate has been maintaining steady, but the overall sample size has been dropping. Okay. Um, do you have any years. thoughts about why? I was just surprised to hear that once it became free, the, the number of people, so you're saying the number of people who signed up for the placement service went down once it was free? Yeah, so basically um, there's a few ways to look at that. Uh, one of them is when placement went free, and I say went free, I mean um, is free for SDS members. Uh, right. That happened simultaneously or a year after, sorry, a year after it went free for members, um, which is the first year that I was working at SDS, they were still putting job ads behind the membership wall, if anybody mm -hmm. remembers that particular time. So what would happen is a job would be posted, it would go private for SES members only or placement members only. And then a month after it was posted, it would be, it would be published publicly. Okay. Um, I, my first year in, I was like, that's kind of stupid. And we just started publishing everything as it came in uh, automatically. So people had, some people had no incentive to sign up for the placement service, right? They now gotcha. can see their jobs posted as they're posted. And there was kind of, it kind of lost the incentive for them to sign up. Now, if you wanted to be interviewed, you still had to sign up. Um, okay. So what happened was the sample size shrunk, but it could never actually get smaller than the number of candidates it's meeting. So right. it's a give and take. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I just hadn't thought about uh, the implication. So it doesn't necessarily correlate to going free. You know, there, there were other factors in there. That's interesting. Um, so why don't we, this is some, we kind of pivot to some of the stuff that we've uh, been talking about in terms of the, the numbers are only as good as people who choose to fill out a an optional survey. And I have been in the room for some different conversations back when sea swimming existed, which now it's something else that I have forgotten the acronym for it that has dissolved and been reconstituted. But um, some of, in terms of getting, I think these were conversations involved with the Women's Classical Caucus around um, gender and race and ethnicity in the field. And there were a couple things that were mentioned there, including um, low response rates being a problem of if you send this out to department heads, there just weren't, um, there weren't high enough response rates. And then also that some of the findings, because the sample size was not big enough, that it was not like statistically significant findings that came out of them. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like, what does it take for something to be statistically significant? What kind of a sample size would you need? Is it about the percentage? Is it about just the raw number of results we have? Is it about the percentage of people who respond? Like what, what does it take for a, a response rate to become statistically significant and be something that we can say meaningful things about? Sure. So, so this is another word like data that's kind of thrown around a lot uh, and has a very, but has a very specific meaning. Um, statistical significance is, when you strip it down, is a number. It is a number that's called a p-value. Um, it is uh, basically, to kind of summarize about a year and a half of statistics work, uh, it is uh, a number that describes the possibility that the results that you just calculated happened accidentally or through error. Okay. So the p-value in your, in your statistics 101 class, your, your ideal p-value is 0 0.05 or less, uh, which means that it is a 5% or less likely chance that you have come up with random numbers on accident. Um, uh, anything lower than that uh, is good. Anything higher than that is bad. And the kind of 0 0.05 um, is kind of your marker. And if it is 0 0.05 or less, it's statistically significant. Okay. Um, now, different fields have different standards. So like in education, um, for example, 0 0.05 is good, but you really kind of want 0 0.01, uh, you know, kind of like, but 
the lower the number gets, the better things are for you. Um, and sometimes they'll accept 0.1, for example. Um, it's so it's this like it's a very flexible but calcul calculatable calculable uh, <laughs> thing that exists. And um, so when you when you're when we talk about statistically significant, that's kind of what that's kind of what we mean. Um, a few things have to happen for that number to exist. Uh, what you're talking about is is you know you have to have your sample size. You have to have um, a certain amount of variables at play, but um, at the end of the day, when you're comparing things, um, you're basically saying, did event X happen because of event Y? And this kind of goes back to what I brought up at the beginning. In classics, we're not ever talking about an event or a right. treatment effect right? Uh, to use the statistical term, treatment effect. Can you um, explain for the non-statistically literate like myself what, <laughs> what treatment absolutely. effect actually means? Absolutely. So um, we, uh, I'm going to use this example and I'm going to start it now because it's going to become relevant later on as well um, of my thesis because it's the thing that I know most about. Um, my master's thesis was um, basically how do we get blue collar fossil fuel workers into work into clean energy, um, to summarize in one sentence. Um, and the effect there was adult education programming. So basically, the treatment effect there would be you have blue collar workers. Uh, they are of a particular age, sex, gender, um, education level, um, ethnicity kind of makeup. It describes them. And then what we do is we say, okay, here are the ones who got an adult certification class, for example, or who got a post-secondary certificate, right? We're very familiar with, in, in colleges, we're very familiar with these like certificate versus associate program versus right. like an auto mechanic um, certificate. Um, and basically after that, did they move to a new career, right? That's, so that's kind of the effect. Did getting this degree make them available for this higher paying, better job? Um, that's kind of your program treatment effect, new career outcome. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm, I'm seeing what you're talking about now in terms of the, these are set up very much like experiments, right? Does, does this cause this to happen? And yeah, uh, that doesn't, I, I'm already seeing kind of where you're coming from in this perspective of like, that's not how we talk about things in, in classics generally when we're, you know, it's like, right. why aren't we more diverse? Why aren't we, you know, and it, it, it's not, it's not formulated in this kind of hypothesis way that, that takes me back to science fair projects sort of. <laughs> Right, right. And that, that's very much what it's attempting to replicate. And right, and the thing that you learn very quickly in statistics is even if you go through all of those steps with a lot of numbers and it's statistically significant, you haven't actually proved that causation happens, right? The field of causal studies is actually a step beyond statistics that I don't even understand because it's absurdly complicated and you couldn't have paid me enough money to sit through those classes. Um, <laughs> but what we're talking about in classics, which is still important, is we wanna know if the numbers that we have are representative. That's usually what, I, what people mean when they say, say statistical significance, when they're talking about a demographic only survey, is do these numbers represent accurately what we were trying to measure or was it just a random group of people who filled it out and we actually don't have any information? Gotcha. And so then, I mean, the follow-up question is, uh, what, <laughs> what, would, what, what isn't happening, just because the last, the last set of attempted data gathering that I am aware of um, more or less got thrown out because it was deemed not statistically significant. And so what, um, I guess if you could maybe also contextualize, like I, I only know of this because I happened to be in a meeting where people were talking about these numbers, but um, could you talk just a little bit about the, the history of attempts at data gathering in the SCS? And then we can maybe talk about what, what is missing that is causing it to not be statistically significant. Sure, sure. Um, 
So uh, this is some history that I, I did fairly early. I say early on. I've only been working there four years, but it feels, you know. You've only been there four years? Yeah, is... it feels longer. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that's good or bad for either of us. Um, but um, yeah, four years. Um, wow. Yeah, cool. so. Okay. That's <laughs> time. <laughs> time is a weird thing. Tell me about it. Uh, and it ain't getting less weird by the moment. So, <laughs> um, fairly early on, I kind of sat down to the same thing. It was like, okay, what exists? What doesn't exist? Where are the gaps? And the answer is that there are just time wise, there's a lot of gaps in data gathering. And this is kind of owing to the structure of the SES. I think a lot of people, maybe not a lot of people, I'm, I might be projecting a little bit <laughs> when I say this. Um, uh, a, I believe, I, I, don't, I want to get my timeline right, but um, Helen and I have been there for four years. Helen beat me out by a couple of months. Okay. And before that, Adam uh, Blistein uh, was there mm -hmm. 17 oh, wow. years. I don't remember if that's correct. There's, it's a double digit number that is between 10 and 17. Uh, here's there a while. <laughs> um, but end of the day, uh, SDS is 152 this year. Um, so you have a situation in which, um, you know, there were executive director um, uh, analogs, right? In the executive secretary, Roger Bagnell was one of them. John Marincola was the one before him, um, who, while being scholars full time, also ran the society full time. Um, but without dedicated office staff, we've had maybe, what is that? If we just round and say 15 years, we've had a 10th of the society's history has had dedicated office staff with an executive director attached to it, right? Okay. So every bit of data that has been gathered or every attempt to gather data, even sometimes during the years where there was an executive director has been dependent on um, committees, it's been dependent on uh, board members. In other words, it's been dependent on people who have full-time jobs teaching or researching to also now collect data from membership. Um, gotcha. And like we talked about at the top, through no fault of their own, um, <laughs> they have not been trained in the gathering of data because they were too busy learning four languages, two of which were dead, uh, and reading more than most humanities majors do in foreign languages for a 300 plus page dissertation that they had to write, right? They had a lot on their plate, <laughs> is, is, is what I was trying to, what I'm trying to get at. And they did so while they had another full-time job. So um, these, are, these are kind of like the environments in which data was attempted to be collected and Back in the day that was done by mail, um, there are attempts by the newly formed WCC in the 70s to get data um, from the membership, mostly filled out through mail. Uh, they had a pretty good job of getting a good response rate um, in terms of like what we would consider a good response rate from the membership. Um, and then there were gaps because they didn't have time to do it every year. And then the uh, SES office tried doing it and they had maybe, you know, if you go to, for example, to the placement data page, there's a solid run of about 10 years of data in there. And then a gap between 2014 and 2016, um, okay. because that's when there was this, a thing happened and then it picked up, the data collection picked up again when I started there. Okay. So like the data collection is inconsistent. And when you're talking about trying to determine long-term trends for a field, inconsistent data will kill you because at a certain point you can't say, you know, and I'm pulling a number out of nowhere here, um, but you can't say the SES membership has declined or increased its black membership percentage when you either weren't looking for that or two, you were looking for it, but then there's a five-year gap in the 90s and then a two-year gap twice in the 2010s. You know what I'm saying? 
it's right. there's when you get to a certain level of inconsistent data gather, data gathering um you can't really say say a thing with certainty anymore um which is uh kind of what we're talking about with p values right like at a certain point um you have to have a certain number of responses and then those responses have to be consistent for a certain amount of time before you can comfortably sit down and say, okay, I can say that it looks like this and I can say that confidently and now we can make a decision off of that information. Okay. Thank you. That is a, that is a lot. Of, <laughs> I know it's a lot of information. <laughs> no, I mean, this is, this is stuff that I think, um, I mean, this is, this is a big part of why, why it seemed like a good idea to have this conversation because I think a lot of us don't know any of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes in terms of like, who decides that we should do some kind of, of demographic survey? Who decides these things? Um, so I guess if we could talk, it seems like getting, getting results from, uh, getting responses from people are, is one of the biggest in terms of getting like a valuable set of demographic data. And then, um, definitely want to pivot to talk about like the, the questions that should be motivating, uh, the gathering of data. But, um, so in terms of trying to get better responses, did these go out to chairs of depart? I mean, how are there, are there ideas about how to get a better response rate? Because it seems as though that, that is a big stumbling block in the way of, of having something meaningful we can talk about here. Yeah, yeah. And if, if I could, I could, I actually want to go back to something that you mentioned, which is um, who decides that the data should be gathered in the first place. Um, most of the SCS leadership positions um, are elected or appointed and they're term limited. Um, so I'm, again, I'm pulling, I'm not trying to call out any particular person here. I'm going to pull a committee out of my hat. Uh, out of a hat here, uh, say the the Committee on Education, on K through 12 education, for example, um, decides in the 90s that they want to figure out um, the demographics of K through 12 Latin teachers for let's make it reasonable, right? Let's for um, the Virginia and Maryland uh, area, right? The the um, DMV, right? D District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia area. Um, that chair, if I'm not mistaken, I probably am mistaken, uh, has a three-year term, the, the chair of that committee has a three-year term limit. Um, and if the chair after that chair decides that that information is no longer valuable or they want to spend their committee time doing something else, they have every right to do so. Uh, and then suddenly that data stops being collected. Um, Interesting, okay. So much like, and I'm gonna use my, I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to get on my own hobby horse for a second. Uh, much like education reform, um, the actual way to implement education policy is to make a very robust and specific policy and then don't touch it for 15 years. Um, that's never gonna happen because politics does not allow for that sort of change to happen in that way, which is fine. You know, we learn and we get better and we do it a different way. But um, at a certain point, uh, there needs to be guiding principles about data collection and then it needs to remain that way consistently um is there and this is this is just coming purely from from a place of ignorance but um is there any reason that things couldn't be implemented to say that certain committees have a standing mandate to do x data i mean is there could that be written into committee descriptions where it isn't as much at the discretion of the people who happen to be there on this this quickly rotating basis like could that be if bylaws were changed, if the membership voted, if whatever, like, could that be written into some of these committees so that there, there isn't the chance that numbers could just disappear for three to five years for some reason? Uh, that is a question that is a little bit beyond my understanding of the bylaws of the SCS, because that's okay. essentially, that is, a, that is a fundamental reorganizing of, um, of committee structures. Um, so, I don't want to answer it on a recording because <laughs> I'll get it wrong. Uh, but um, sure, uh, there is a there is an avenue for exploring the possibility of seeing how that would go. Okay, <laughs> so I, I don't mean to I put you speak speak for the entire organization right now. 
Um, but no, I'm just wondering if, 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 you know, there, if there was an obvious reason I wasn't aware of that that couldn't be something. Because I mean, that seems like something that's maybe worth exploring in terms of if, if it's important to us to have better demographic data. You know, we, we do occasionally have things that go out to the whole membership to vote on of, are yes. we okay with rewriting this or with rewriting that? And so, um, yeah, that's interesting. I think I derailed say, something we were talking about. And I yeah, no, I derailed it uh, because <laughs> I, I, want, I said I wanted to go back to your further, your former question, but we're going to get to what you were, what you asked me, which was um, data collection, how to do it. Um, huh, yeah. So we collect data outside of placement, um, which is its own beast. Uh, we collect data a number of ways. Um, chances are most of the people I'm talking to are familiar with it. Um, we will send an email to all of members saying, here's a survey to fill out. Um, we will, uh, actually that's pretty much the main, the main way of doing it. Um, sometimes we will contact department chairs and ask them to fill out um, what's called a census. I believe we do our census. Oh gosh, this is really exposing my on the spot knowledge of SCS <laughs> guidance and bylaws. I believe we have a census every four years. Okay. Um, it's in our it's in our bylaws in, uh, that we in, have. To 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 be fair, I did not tell you I was going to be deep diving into the bylaws when we talked about like what questions should we talk about. That was not one of the things I mentioned. Mm, yeah, but you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate your forgiveness. Um, I believe every four years we have a census, and that's one of those that is important enough that we actually we actually contract out for for response rate and getting it to people, like an actual survey firm uh, does the work of making sure that people fill that out, make sure they fill it out fully. Um, that'll go to department chairs. Um, sometimes we'll just do it ourselves, but not for the, not for the census, for something a little bit smaller, like um, uh, um, by the time this goes online, this should probably be out already, so I think I can talk about it. Um, we're just going to do a really brief employment survey of people, uh, basically saying, "What's your what's your employment status now? What do you anticipate it will be next year?" Just to get a sense of how people's employment is shifting during COVID and uh, mm -hmm. during this year in general, just to kind of anticipate needs and anticipate what people are going to what's going to be most effective to help people. Um, that's probably just going to go out to people straight up. Um, in our experience, it is extremely difficult to get these kind of uh, kind of useful response rates from people. And there's a few reasons as to why that is. Uh, and it's not all because people just don't like filling out surveys. Uh, but one of the big things is people don't like filling out surveys. And one of the reasons that is, is because I think we sent out um, the better part of maybe 10 surveys to members last year alone. It's a lot of surveys. It's a lot of it's, surveys. It's a lot of people's time, uh, and time is extremely precious, and it's not getting less precious by the year. Um, that is, uh, there are a lot of reasons for why that is. Sometimes uh, some committees will decide they want a thing, and we won't have time, for example, to slip it into the annual meeting survey, um, mm -hmm. or we won't have time to slip it into a larger survey. Um, typically, uh, in terms of just basic statistics, the less survey, the less surveys you bombard people with, the more likely they are to fill it out, right? Like, if people only have to spend 30 minutes filling out one survey a year, whereas uh, they're probably going to fill that out, whereas if somebody gets their seventh survey from their organization in July from an organization they already delete half the emails to, that response rate's going down. Right. That's we understand now, that that's a possibility. Now, just on that topic, are there um, mm -hmm. does it or maybe we don't know this, but does it skew response rates? It, my my thought is one of two. Like if if people are feeling survey fatigue, um, people who really care about the question are going to be more likely to to submit answers. Right. Um, do we know how much that's going to influence the what the results are, are looking like. So, I mean, it seems like there are certain, either people who have a real horse in the race on, on one side or the other, right? So if we're thinking about something in terms of 
diversifying around race and ethnicity, diversifying the field. It seems like people who are very vested in there's not a problem, we don't even need to be, everything's great, or people who have, have really experienced racism and experienced discrimination. Um, and that seems like it, it risks throwing off the numbers in, in some substantial way, but I don't know. I mean, do you have thoughts about that? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, and uh, one, yes, um, the people who fill out surveys are the people typically who are affected either positively or negatively most. Um, we see that actually pretty clearly in the placement numbers, if you can believe it. Uh, there was a time where, um, I actually don't remember if I did this my first or second year. I believe it was my second year, but um, I basically, I had placement data in front of me and it was a kind of low response rate. I wanted it to be better. Um, and what was happening was either the people who were really happy weren't filling out the placement survey. And so everybody who was angry was filling it out. And then it looked like placement was doing a very bad job. Granted, there are places for placement to improve, um, uh, but you know, it, it didn't look right. So what I did my second year was I said, all right, here's an option. It's question number one. Um, I had a good time with placement and I don't want to answer any more questions. <laughs> and that was the only question you had, or, or it was people, or you could say I had a bad time with placement and I don't want to answer any more questions. Um, implementing that question actually increased our response rate pretty well. Um, okay. Because what would happen was people would be like, oh, thank God, I don't have to have an opinion about a thing. That's the, again, another personal hobby horse. Sometimes people just do not want to have an opinion and that is an okay situation. Um, I mean, I've definitely filled out surveys where as soon as like, <laughs> what comments do you have? I'm like, oh, I don't want to write things. I can click, <laughs> I'm fine clicking boxes. I don't want to like write out thoughts. That seems too involved. And so, yeah, I, yeah. I can absolutely see that like, I happy, no complaints or angry, don't want to talk about it. It would it helps. get a much higher response rate. And, and another thing that happens uh, when you're talking about people who are affected, what will actually happen is sometimes the people who perhaps whose opinion we, we perhaps value most, for example, like who is affected by racist acts, actions, or, you know, implementation or policy, um, will not fill out a survey because in a field like classics, there are so few people of color that they'll fear being identified. Uh, they'll fear um, uh, being unable to um, describe their situation without naming names or getting somebody else in trouble or getting a person in trouble who will retaliate against them. Right. Um, I was going to say, I mean, it seems like the field is small enough that mm -hmm. making an anonymous complaint is is just not going to be anonymous, right? I mean, I think that becomes when we, um, there were some, I think the WCC did some work around uh, sexual harassment and kind of at the, the height of the, the Me Too movement um, around, around sexual harassment, around uh, abuse, around bullying. And, you know, there's a lot of stories people just are waiting till they have tenure to tell because they don't feel safe because it's it's a small enough place that like there aren't that many people who had that specific situation at that meeting um and so i mean i think the the size of the field is you know english is a huge field it, it, you have a little bit more anonymity whereas in classics you can in, do a lot of work anonymizing a story and still eight people on twitter will be like oh no i know who that is um, and so, you know, it's, it's very, it, it, I think that, that in terms of actual incidents of, of things, it, that makes it really hard for people to feel like they can share that information. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like, I mean, almost not on all of the surveys, but on a good chunk of those surveys, we're asking your institution, you fill out that institution and guess what? We now have five people to choose from and we can probably guess who filled out the survey. Right, that's that makes people nervous, and I understand why. So um, I, I I I worry I just derailed us again. Um, we were talking about reasons people don't fill stuff out. Uh, the other reason is, um, you know, for example, we talked about department chairs. A lot of things go to department chairs, uh, not just from us, but from other people. Um, the odds of a department chair going on sabbatical, and we don't know about it, super high. Uh, we. We have a really hard time, if you can believe it, um, keeping up with just who a department chair is. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say um, a good chunk of, well, we'll get like a summer intern. During normal circumstances, we'll get a summer intern. Uh, and one of the things that we'll have them do if we don't have like a big thing going on is 
go and check department websites to make sure we have the right department chair because mm. maybe they went on sabbatical and it changed. Maybe that department chair on the website is wrong. Uh, I was going to say chair, that's, that sure relies on the, the idea that the website is updated. But uh huh, the department chair on the NYU website was wrong for a solid three years there, and the only reason we knew that was because SCS is located at New, at NYU. Um, <laughs> so things like that uh, make mean that an email is going to a dead account or an email is going to an account of somebody who is uh, in Greece for a summer and is not going to check their email. They're just not going to do it. Um, so this, there's a lot of things that stack up. And at the end of the day, I want to remind people, I wanted to remind people at the top, but I'm going to say it as many times as I can. I see his office is three people. Uh, it is uh, Shireen, who single-handedly plans a meeting of <laughs> 2,300 plus, 2,500 plus people, uh, which by the way, in other organizations is unheard of. She would have support staff, um, but she does it because she's very good at her job. Uh, Helen, who runs the organization, um, <laughs> and does things that other executive directors don't necessarily do, like budget, fundraising, um, publications, you know, things that, again, they would have support staff for. And then there's me just trying to keep up with everything else. Um, so, you know, the, the amount to which uh, the time that we have to call every department, for example, which would be the most efficient thing to do, call every department in the country uh, and ask who the department chair is, we don't have time to do it. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that is that yeah. is a good reminder because I think it feels like this is our big organization. There must be tens, hundreds of people working behind the scenes, hiding all that information that you don't want to share with us. But yeah, yeah. it's um, so I following up on that. Um, there, I think there is a big problem in terms of the SCS members are not necessarily representative of the fields as a whole for a variety of reasons. Right? I mean it's fairly representative of people at people with secure employment at universities and not even necessarily there, but um, you know, in terms of a lot of grad students aren't going to be members because they can't afford the membership. A, a big part of our field is the, you know, if we think about the K-12 or the people who have left official academia, but still think of themselves as part of the classics community, um, podcasters and authors who are kind of classics peripheral, and I know, I mean, I know the SCS is primarily a professional organization and the membership, you know, is, is chosen and, and accordingly. But um, if we want to think about kind of the big picture, the state of the field, it seems like there's some big glaring holes in terms of who, who would even get an email asking for a survey, right? Like, our, I mean, most K-12 teachers are not going to be on your mailing list because why would they be an SCS member? It's... Uh, I mean, this is, this is a separate hobby course of mine, but it's not a particularly welcoming meeting for a lot of people, including um, K-12 teachers do not often feel like they are uh, welcomed with open arms at this meeting. Uh, and so, you know, there's, I mean, do you have thoughts about, does the SES ever partner with ACL, J, other, other organizations that are in, in greater contact with high school Latin teachers, things like that, because it seems like if we do want to talk about a lot of graduate students who either don't get jobs in at, like faculty positions or decide they don't want to be, that that is not their course, uh, the course that they want to pursue, end up going other routes. And it seems like a lot of that data is just not going to get captured from the SES perspective. And for any conversations about kind of the state of the field in the country, we're missing big chunks of that. Yeah. Um... That's something I think about a lot. And I, I have like an anecdote to maybe maybe try to enlighten it a little bit better. Um, to answer your question, um, yes, we are in contact with, if you can name a classics organization, we're probably in contact with it. Um, there are, the field's pretty small and the number of organizations that represent it are even smaller. Um, so the amount to which there's any barrier there, if we don't know about them, it's, we, that's, it's very rare that Helen and I are surprised when we get an email from a classics organization we don't recognize. Okay. Um, and usually when that's happened, which it, it has before, uh, it's been like, hey, it's our like second week of doing things and we just kind of started this out of nowhere. Could you, could you send along this, this news story? <laughs> it's like, oh, sure. <laughs> Can you call us so that we know that you're not like 
trolls on the internet or something. I just want to make sure you're real. That's all. Um, <laughs> which, which again, you know, has happened. Um, our inboxes are can be real, real fun some days. Um, but anyway, back to my back to my anecdote. When I was, I did my undergrad at University of Maryland, and that is where I um, kind of discovered classics quickly. I knew nothing about the field; didn't know it existed uh, before then. Um, and people who were there at the time, uh, and people who are still there now, as a matter of fact, very involved in the K through 12 world. Uh, and the University of Maryland was a pretty big funnel for Latin teachers in the region. Um, and it was very clear to me, it was made very clear to me rather, that the DMV area, again, DC, um, Maryland and Virginia area, has had a shortage of Latin teachers for years. Um, they have capacity for more, they're ready to hire more, and they can't because nobody knows that they, that, that sort of exists. Um, I have told everyone I've ever met in the classics capacity this information <laughs> since I was an undergrad because I thought it was wild. Um, and as the SCS, I think I have at two points since the newsletter started um, commissioned a K through 12 teacher from that area to talk about that problem. Um, it has not made a dent. And I'm not sure where the communication gets lost, but it's like there's this K through 12 area, sometimes in great need and ready to hire. And then there's higher ed classics. And then at some point, the signal just drops. And I'm not mm, sure where it I happens. Have I have I have a strong theory, which is okay. that I would like to hear. Uh, we I think we still we still treat teaching um, at the K twelve level as though it's a failure, um, and I think as that is that is what you do if you can't get a faculty position, um, and I think that I mean a lot of people are aware that that is wrong and harmful rhetoric and it does a huge disservice to a ton of people involved um, in. Although, but I think I think there's still very much this kind of stigma at a lot of institutions that we're not going to publicize, uh, you know, high school teaching as a viable career option because that would mean that we failed and you failed and everybody failed. And I think I think it's getting a little bit better, um, particularly as people are realizing how few people are going to get secure employment at the university level. But it's still very much seen as a second choice option for people who people who can't get or a, can't hack it at the university level, which is, I suspect why a lot of it, that, that message never gets to the students who would love to know that there are, you know, you don't have to get a PhD necessarily, like a lot of, a lot of undergraduates who, there are great options for undergraduates classics, getting your teaching credentials, doing a combo teaching, um, you know, or a master's in teaching with Latin, and teaching high school Latin, uh, but I think we we don't talk about it as much because a lot of faculty still have this idea that it is it is some kind of a failure, and so we're not going to publicize that because we want you to go on to become us, and and that is the only valid career choice, which is a whole separate uh, a whole separate rant. But I think I think a lot of it has to do with uh, some very outdated and harmful ideas about about what what a good career path in classics looks like. Sure. So I, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't think it's an accident. I think there is actually some a lot of yeah. people who hear this and are like, I'm not gonna share that. It's it's not an accident. And I'll say one thing and then I'll try to like tie in data to the conversation because it is still <laughs> relevant. Um I, I well I, I believe the point will be be well heard is that um to get, kind of tip my hand of my own theory of change uh over here. Um, um I'm a big I'm a big believer in the fact that uh measurable policy is the only way that change comes about. Uh, we could have uh, 20 panels on K through 12 teaching at the annual meeting out of uh, the 90. We could have 80 panels on K through 12 teaching over the 90. Uh, and uh, if there is not measurable policy and measurable change uh, in actual institutional pipelines, then it won't matter. Uh, the next right. year, K through 12 teaching will continue to hold the same spot. And we talk about a lot of things like failures. We talk about Technically, I am a classics failure. Uh, I uh, got my undergrad, I did one year of grad school and I failed and I dropped out. Um, do I think I'm a classics failure? No, uh, but I've gotten emails that people who say I'm a classics failure uh, from in the classics field. So 
it's a matter Whoa, of like what? that kind of that level of what kind cultural... of person feels the need to email someone just to share that they think they're a classics failure uh much like uh-huh. the surveys i'm not going to name names because people will know who they are uh i can't even describe the situation anyway um what i'm saying is uh for example uh, it has long been tradition for pe- for departments to say where their graduates are teaching now. Um, again, I'm going to pull institutional names out of a hat. Uh, if I'm Harvard and I had ten, I graduated ten classics PhDs, and three of them went to go teach at Cornell, USC, and um, U Washington. Uh, I'm going to put Cornell, USC, and U Washington. I'm going to put those grad names, and I'm going to put them right on the front of that website. Um, If two of those um, people went to go work for the DOJ, uh, I'm not gonna publicize that. If three of those uh, were going to go be K through 12 teachers, I'm not gonna put that on the website. And then if two others started a business together that solved cancer, I'm sure as hell not gonna put that on the website. So the idea of who we glorify and kind of the processes by which we we talk about these things, not like verbally, when I say talk about things, I mean institute policy in which we say and show that this is valued, that is valued, this is what we support, that is what we support. Um, that is how this sort of thing moves, moves along a little bit further. And there are ways that the SES can be doing some of those things, and there are ways where that stuff needs to happen at the departmental level, that needs to happen at the personal level, and it needs to happen at um, sometimes at the K through 12 level as well. Um, but to bring all of the data back in, <laughs> um, in short, because I don't wanna, I, I, we have a lot to cover still. Um, organizations like CAMWIS, CAS, ACL, uh, Kane, uh, more or less from our conversations with them have the exact same data problems that we have. Uh, mm-hmm. It is not unique to SCS and they haven't figured it out either. So. Um, yeah. (laughs) So, uh, there, I'm going to try and not, not make this a too specific of a question. Um, there are, there are some people who feel that there is a resistance to gathering information. So like you had mentioned, you have this information that's embarrassing and we're not going to share it. Um, and there are definitely many people who with good grounds, think that certain organizations are averse to asking about some of these questions. When you talk about kind of what questions do we want to ask with our data, um, there are questions we don't want to ask because we don't want to know how bad it is, right? So, I mean, this this classics is not a diverse field, but we don't know exactly how undiverse. Are we worse than philosophy? Are we, you know, like, um, and not having those numbers means that we can always be like, well, I guess we don't know, and maybe we'll never know. There's no way to know. Um, do you get the impression that that is a part of, like, is it is it a factor of it being very hard to get these numbers for all the reasons we've talked about, or do you think that there is some some foot dragging and some some resistance to, if we asked more of these questions, if we knew exactly, um, you know, the NLE is a place where you can gather a lot of data, right? If we ask some specific questions, then then we have to deal with the answer that we get, and it would be easier if we didn't have to. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, and um, I can say this with confidence that that has absolutely been a factor uh, over the over. If we're talking historically of the SES, um, there is n- no doubt that a conversation has been had in a room where it was you know, uh, the smoking jackets and the cigars, and it was, well, maybe, (laughs) maybe we just shouldn't. Um, uh, And more often than not, that, uh, that conversation has undoubtedly continued in the 21st century in more coded and socially acceptable terms. Uh, I would caution people always, because it is far more likely and is getting increasingly more likely as time goes on, especially in the time that I've been at the SCS, that you should not attribute to, what's the, what's the quote? Don't attribute to malice what can be, um, uh, that can be explained by incompetence. Um, at the, at this, how do I, how do I say this? 
at an organization in which I do not currently work and cut a paycheck at, um, there was a discussion about um, polling demographic information of their membership that involved mixed race uh, identification. Because um, when, you know, the eth eth uh, kind of polling race and ethnography is kind of, or ethnicity rather, um, is getting increasingly like, we're getting better at it. Uh, but by getting better at it, it's actually getting very complicated to kind of sort out what these things mean. Um, and at the end of the day, a decision is made, again, not at an organization I work at or paycheck at, um, to not include mixed race as uh, one of the identifiers because when they were to get, the, they decided that when they were to get the data back, they were not going to be able to sort out properly what it meant. Um, they, they felt that um, having, a, having some information was better than having no information, which they currently had. Um, and that their future data needs were going to be built off of a better informed understanding of what being mixed race meant. Um, so when the survey went out that did not have mixed race as an, as an option for ethnicity, they got a lot of public uh, blowback and they were very quiet on the issue and they lost a lot of like, you know, I say political support, they probably lost some monetary support as well, but like visually out in the world, they lost supporters. Um, same sort of situation applies. Um, mm -hmm. When an organization that is of our age and a field that is of our kind of demographic makeup as it already is, the idea that we as an organization would ever try to understand these deeply rooted and very complicated questions of why is our race so white? Why, or, uh, why is our race so white? Why is our field so white? Uh, why is our scholarship so male? Why is our um, meeting so tilted towards um, the economically secure. Um, a lot of these things have answers. A lot of these things can be measured. The idea that we would ever have to figure out how or why, um, and to do so in a field through a, through a means that we were neither trained nor prepared to use, um, I think has taken the four years I worked at the SCS to kind of get over the shock of it. Um, <laughs> and move into a space where we could be comfortable talking about it. And those conversations have become much more comfortable in my time here. Um, and now it's just a matter of, okay, we got it. Now we have to do it and we have to do it right. And those are not the same thing. Um, we, could, we could put a demographic survey out right now. Um, I could probably write it in a couple minutes, but it is not going to be methodo methodologically sound um, if we don't ask the questions that we actually need to ask to answer them. Um, and at that point, we're wasting time, we're wasting money, and we've insulted a ton of our members. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so before we kind of pivot to, because we had kind of framed this as like, let's, you know, talk about the <laughs> this lay of the land, how things are now, and then kind of looking yeah. forward looking. Um, one other thing, I know when you had, had tweeted the, the, the tweet that started this conversation, um, some people, some folks from the UK had mentioned like they, they have, mm -hmm. they have good numbers. Um, do you, do you know what, like, do you have a sense of why they seem to have better? Is it is it a matter of size? Is it a matter of concentration, institutional things? Um, is you know, I mean, the U.S. is is huge, and we have states doing all of their own different things and different types of institutions. Um, does do you have a, a sense of why it seems as though uh, the U.K. might be able to to have a better a better idea of what their their field looks like than we seem to? Yeah. Yeah, I have a, uh, there's a lot of reasons. Um, 
you know, I could I could give the easy answer, which is that the UK is 66 million people and the United States is over 350 million. Um, but that is a lazy answer, I believe. Um, there's a lot of things, both systematically and kind of culturally in place that um, make it very difficult in the US to get that sort of information. And not just to kind of put aside how the field looks, to put it just raw numbers, um, I'm going to talk about something called iPads, I-P-E-D-S. Um, if that's not I definitely something that's heard new, iPads when you said that. I was like, oh, iPad. like a tablet. <laughs> cool. Alas, uh, iPads. <laughs> okay. Um, if it is an unfamiliar term to a listener, um, iPads is essentially, uh, if I can oversimplify a very complicated thing, um, it is a federal program that requires public universities to say facts about their programming. Number of students, number of majors, people in the class, number of professors, adjuncts, etc. For example, when the humanities indicators came out recently and said, these are how many classics classes were taught in 2017, I think is the most recent one. Uh, they knew that because they identified iPads data. Uh, and iPads data typically will come from a department chair, will get an email like they get thousands of every day, and it will be from their university's iPads office or public data office or whatever the university has set up to collect this data. And they'll say, it's time for you to put this information into this system and they put in things like there are 20 people in our Latin one class, there are five people in our Greek one class, and there are 300 students in our big classics mythology lecture class. Uh, we have five professors this year on staff and we have two of our adjuncts. And they put this information in. And then the information goes to the federal government and that is re it's required for their federal funding. So you know that they do it. Um, that becomes very complicated when the University of Maryland's Latin One class looks very different from the University of Washington's Latin One class. Maybe at University of Maryland, Latin One is a part of a four class cycle that eventually ends in reading authors and leads into seminars. Maybe at the University of Washington, I do not know this for a fact, uh, it is a two course series. And after Latin Two, there's no more offerings because they don't have the staff or the capacity to do more Latin. That's not in iPads. Right. All that's in iPads is that for Lat whatever University of Washington has identified as Latin One, that's the number of students, and University of Maryland has identified this number of students, and that's it. Okay. So you see how when you then expand that to a nation full of different states, full of different university systems that are all counting differently, how those numbers can look radically different, be inconsistent, and make us feel like we do as a field, which I do believe is like a field feeling that we are not accurately counting our systems because we're not. Right. Whereas you have a place like the UK, which is, again, you know, it's not a data perfect place. Anybody who says their place is data perfect should be <laughs> called into question. Um, not saying that that's, uh, that's what's happening, but just something to remind everybody. Um, a little bit more centralized, a little bit more regulated, and it's sure not perfect, and it's definitely not without the same issues that I just described. But um, when you have fewer people to count and you have a little bit more regulation, you get a little bit of better numbers. Um, when I talked about culturally earlier, um, What's the acronym? Is it the CAA over there? Their classics association, their big classics association? Just the CA. The CA? Just the classical association. Yet another thing that I should definitely know uh, and <laughs> am getting wrong in front of people who are going to maybe watch. Um, <laughs> they're, um, they're, they, run, they run different than us. They run different than the SCS. They have different standards. They have different ways of operation. Um, all of that changes uh, how people respond to things. If they have a very big initiative that they want to count demographics of their field, um, 
it's going to look different than us trying to do that through departments, for example. Even our methodologies, even internally at the SES, right? We could ask departments uh, how many adjunct faculty they have, or we could look at iPads, or we could survey our members. All three of those things are going to give us three different numbers, if not four different numbers. And we have to reconcile that for ourselves and then say, all right, which of these numbers is right? Right? Um, it's an extremely complicated question. Um, but size helps. <laughs> and um, a little bit of a different methodology is going to go a long way as well. But again, you can say you have better numbers, but um, kind of what I would then follow up with is, all right, what questions are you asking of that of those numbers? Right? Because if those questions aren't better or different, then you're not solving anything. You just have better numbers. So that is a beautiful, look at you setting up segues, just setting up a softball and I'm gonna boom, hit it out of the park here. Um, so in terms of, I, I know you get a lot of emails with the SCS should, uh, and if- And tweets. I, <laughs> and tweets and people skywriting things over the office, I'm sure. Um, but in terms of what the kinds of questions, and I, I know you don't speak for the SCS here, but as someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about education policy and, and is intimately familiar with a lot of the conversations um, at and about the SCS, um, what are the kinds of questions that you think would be useful questions to, to be thinking about? Because I can, I can think of end goals that I want for our field, um, but in terms of the questions that the tools available to us can answer, like I don't know if, you know, the, the, the big picture question or the big picture problems I would like solved are like, could we be less racist and more diverse? That'd be cool. Um, and, you know, on a, on a variety, I mean, right now I think, you know, like racial and ethnic diversity is kind of at the front of everyone's mind, but there are big problems with around um, first gen folks who do not have access to generational wealth um, that like, are you gonna be able to, if you can't have your parents help you move from adjunct to adjunct to adjunct position to in hopes of getting that tenure track gig, we're losing a lot of people just because it is very expensive to be contingent faculty. And so, I mean, I think there's, there are a lot of fronts around which things could be better. Um, some of them are problems that face higher ed as a whole, and I don't think that classics can extricate itself from some of the problems that face higher ed as a whole. But um, what what questions do you think we should be asking, or what questions could be answered with the types of data that might be available to us, or could be available to us? Sure. Um, I, I want to, again, lead in with an anecdote. Um, and, uh, or not, maybe not an anecdote, but perhaps a, a little bit of a more political thing to say. Um, when, and speaking as somebody who comes from uh, a, a very long history, personal history of supporting terribly, increasingly, radically progressive candidates for political office, um, when the, uh, during the 2020 primary, which is over for the Democratic uh, Party in particular, um, when there was a lot of discussion about youth turnouts, um, co a conversation that was echoed back in 2008 uh, when uh, a senator named Barack Obama was running as well, um, there was um, a lot of emphasis, uh, particularly in, in the Sanders campaign, to get a lot of uh, young people to come out to vote. Um, by and large, numbers wise in the places that needed to that needed that 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 needed to happen it didn't happen very much um you look at general elections where for centuries uh parties democratic party in particular has said youth turnout is really important youth turnout has dropped substantially um in other places sometimes states individually sometimes other countries um, when the policy of automatic voter registration at age 18 was implemented, voter turnout among young people went up, and it went up by double digit percentages. Um, I, I say this to illustrate the point that I want to make about classics data, which is that um, talking about a thing is not enough and is 
can actually be pretty destructive um, and dis uh, not disruptive, uh, destructive rather um, towards the goal. Actually removing barriers, removing things that are keeping people from doing the thing that you want to happen uh, in the long run and in the short run is actually turns out to be a lot more, more effective. That does not mean that, you know, extremely useful work like work being done by Sportula both on the fundraising front and now on the conference organizing front. Um, I don't know how many tools they got in their tool shed that they're just going to keep bringing out. But um, <laughs> if I could sit here and I, I mean, us sitting around and praising Sportula is, is, you know, fun for us and useful for nobody else. But um, <laughs> uh, my, my point there was, you know, um, making actual policy change alongside of demands and alongside of public conversation um, will go a really, really long way. But no, I mean, I think, I think one of the, some of, you know, to use, to use the example of, of people coming from lower, socio lower socioeconomic background, man, words are hard, um, is mm -hmm. we can, you know, we can talk about marketing and branding. And I think a lot of times that is, that is where the conversation goes about how do, like, how do we tell people that classics can be for everyone? Um, but then there's also like the very concrete, tangible, and this is something that the Sportula has addressed a lot of like, our books are crazy expensive. If you want to buy a Greek text, mm -hmm. like good Lord almighty, it's, you know, 60 bucks just for the text, not the commentary, not for, um, and so, I mean, I think when we think about the barriers to entry, there, there are a variety, right? There, I mean, there's the kind of psychological barriers to entry of thinking like, I don't belong here because I am the only person who hasn't vacationed with their family to Rome every summer or, or whatever. So, you know, maybe classics isn't for me. Everyone keeps talking about all these museums they've gone to and the things they've seen. Um, and, you know, then, I mean, so there, there's the messages that the field from the top and from all angles um, are sending potential students. But then there are those, those very concrete structural barriers of like, well, if you, if you need to go on a dig to be a competitive candidate for grad school, but also going on a dig requires paying money to, for the privilege of doing manual labor all summer, whereas I need that job this summer. So like, I just can't, I can't have my summer go from money coming in to being money going out. Um, and, you know, so I think when we talk about ways to possibly change barriers, like making actual changes about barriers to entry, those are kind of two different conversations. But I think a lot of times we get hung up on the, like, how could we market classics better? And that's not, I mean, you know, rebranding re as not for, like, not a field that is concerned with promoting white supremacy. Like, that, that's a good rebranding. But, you know, that's not, that's not going to do everything that we need. And I think that there's been some recent public public conversations about like how do we how do we grow enrollments how do we promote classics as a as a field and it's not rebranding re isn't going to do it like there there are much bigger structural barriers in in the way of some of these end goals that we may have yeah you actually so uh you uh you reminded me of the point that i was going for which was i talked about sports in the first off because i i love them very much but also um the the point that you brought about them uh funding people's uh, purchase of books is a removal of a barrier for somebody who would otherwise not be able to do that. So that leads me into the point that uh, Danny Bostic made at last, at, I say last year's SCS, even though it's 20, the 2020 SCS, um, which was that she uh, saw that, um, you know, um, she was getting a very particularly white crowd in her, in her Latin classes. Um, and so what she did was she had their, uh, her high school remove Latin from an honors track and put it into a normal, like, you know, their tracks for high school honors and normal or whatever it is they're calling the other track. Uh, she decided to remove from the honors track and her diversity of her classroom went up. That is the removal of a, of a very specific systematic barrier for that people, whether they're in honors track or they're, and they're uh, available to Latin. They might see Latin being in honors uh, as something that makes it, like you said, oh, classics isn't for me because it's one of these crazy honors classes that only X kind of person takes, right? You, but she saw the change didn't happen because they read, uh, why should I study classics part 
10,001 uh, posted on Medium 10 minutes ago, uh, you know, and followed by why should I study classics 10,002 posted five minutes after. Um, it happened because a thing, was, a thing was removed from the system in which was keeping people out of it. Um, that is the kind of, when we sit down to ask questions about what we want to accomplish in classics, one, we have to know what we want. And then two, it has to be, all right, what can we identify as the barriers from this thing happening? And how do we, how do we um, either pull people or ask them uh, how to change this thing? And what I think is being underutilized, and this is gonna be kind of, um, this is an experiment that I'm running. So this might end up being something that three years from now, Eric looks back on and is like, wow, past Eric, you really, really mucked that up for the entire field of classics. Um, for the longest time, when we've sat down to think about data as a field, um, it's been quantitative, which is to say, we are trying to get the biggest number of people to respond uh, so that we can make broad statements about the field and what it looks like. Um, that's useful. But for context, my thesis uh, had a data set of nearly 44,000 respondents. Uh, and that was a pretty small data set. Um, so that when, sounds huge to someone who, for, that sounds big to a, a layperson here. Uh-huh. Well, uh, imagine what it's like for a data analyst at Facebook who have millions of data points in their data packages. Let's not try to think about that too hard, uh, <laughs> yeah. about what that means for our, <laughs> for our digital safety. Uh, but for it, so when, when I sit down, who has sat with like 44,000 observations, when I sit down and I see that I have 300 respondents of our 3,000 members um, responding to a survey about demographics, I don't see that as quantitative anymore. I don't see that as something that I can make sweeping generalizations about our field when I have a 10% response rate of a very small membership. So the potential solution for that, that um, spoiler alert, uh, we're probably going to experiment with a little bit over the next couple of years is switching to a qualitative mindset, which is to say that adopting a research model that asks a very specific question of a very small population in order to make a, you know, a narrow conclusion, but one that could actually help the field if we're asking narrow questions. So, for example, if we wanted to learn a little bit more about a department that was able to um, increase the diversity of their students, instead of sending them a survey or sending the students a survey or sending the faculty a survey of, you know, what is, how many people are in your Latin class? We sit down with the five faculty members in that department and we interview them for two hours apiece. And then we ask them very specific questions about their administrators. And then we go to their administrators and we interview them as well. And we have conversations like the one you and I are having. And then afterwards, somebody, in this case, me, uh, but if somebody else is at the SCS in my position, they're up next. Uh, they sit down at that interview and they're like, okay, what are the five things that everybody at this institution is talking about? And they don't recognize it as the thing that prob probably helps diversify mm, their field. Okay. But sitting, somebody else stepping back and saying, I see all of these pieces kind of coming together. I can then write up a thing that says, you know, to, to Helen or the executive director in, I'm just picking North Carolina because I'm thinking about North Carolina a lot lately. At the University of North Carolina, they have done X, Y, Z. I have this data to back it up and it got more diverse. And it's not causal and it's not necessarily true that what happens in North Carolina is gonna happen in Maine, but it's a start. I think actually that would be more useful for the field. Um, than the stuff that we've been doing. And bonus, um, in education policy, qualitative kind of gets looked down on because it's not big data sets and, you know, oh, if you're not proving that this causes this and blah, 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 blah. I think as humanities people, qualitative is actually going to be really useful and interesting to people who otherwise don't understand data very well. Um, so I had wanted to ask what is uh, probably a 
a very ignorant question again, but um, so a lot of times when people, what is the line between uh, qualitative data and what people often dismiss as like anic data, right? Like how do you, what does it take? Like I can, I can tell you a story about many a department in the field and a, a faculty, you know, the, what, what has to happen for qualitative or for, yeah, qualitative data to be useful in some sense more than just saying, here's, here's a story and we may or may not be able to generalize from, you know, from five people's examples. Like how, how exactly does that work? Cause I think, I think most of us are very much kind of indoctrinated with this idea that like, well, hard numbers are serious because math and science are very serious things. And these kind of things that are more like stories, um, aren't, those aren't numbers. What do we do with that? And so uh, could you just talk a little bit about how qualitative data even works? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So basically, and my, my experience with qualitative uh, is, is um, I'm not going to say tainted. I want a better word. Uh, uh, it is modified uh, by the idea that uh, I was in a field where quantitative data uh, is still highly valued. And um, people who do quantitative, some people who do quantitative, have something that have the same attitude that you're describing um, about qualitative in particular. And so with that in mind, um, the class and training that I have in qualitative, um, basically the methodology of qualitative that is um, utilized by actual bona fide, well done qualitative researchers is turning a lot of different data sources into, for lack of a better word, more numbers. Um, so for example, when a qualitative person sits down and does an interview, like the most, those of us who know very not, like who know nothing about qualitative data know that interviews are done and those interviews somehow mean qualitative data. When a, a qualitative researcher sits down and does an interview with somebody, um, they will afterward probably, they used to type up, now they will computer generate the transcript from that, that conversation. And they will go through line by line and they will, like I said before, they will start to identify common themes. And it's not gonna be like, um, like hope or um, like trust, uh, but it's gonna be things like every time I talk to, I'm gonna use one of my own attempts at qualitative data that I used in class. Um, every time this person talks about their acting company, um, they talk about what it was like to have a very specific community level of support. Uh, and it kept coming back up and it kept coming back up and it kept coming back up. So you start tagging community support, community support, community support. And then when these things are kind of like highlighted and modified off to the side, you go back and you read it some more and you're like, every time they talked about community support, they were reacting and saying they did not have that support at home. They didn't have that support in their office. They didn't have that support in their, in their school. And the only place that they were kind of being validated was in this community organization. And so now you're making that, now you bring that connection and you fold in. And you're doing that with multiple different kind of themes throughout the source of that interview. And if you did it right, you went into that study with a very specific question of what you wanted to find. You asked a person questions that would get at that, that answer without being too specific and letting them kind of expand that zone for you. And then after the interview, which is another thing people don't uh, associate with qualitative data, they do something that actually us classicists and historians and archeologists would be very familiar with, which is they then go and corroborate all of that information through newspapers, physical, um, physical objects. Um, they interview other people to make sure that that person wasn't lying or wasn't misunderstanding the truth. They basically do what we did as, what we do as linguists, as archeologists, as historians, they corroborate, they gather it together to make a point, And then they say that that point means something. Um, 
So it's actually like when I, by the time I was halfway through that class, I was like, I know most of this methodology and it didn't come <laughs> from quantitative. I did it in my ancient history class over and over yeah, again. Yeah, I was going to say, this feels very methodologically familiar. Like that seems, um, mm -hmm. and so yeah, that's, that's really interesting, especially because, I mean, when you were describing this, my immediate thought was like, well, but what if you ask, I think, I think we are all familiar with situations where the professor's opinion might not align with the student's opinion, right? And so mm -hmm. the idea of like, well, just five people said this and there were some common words, they talked about teamwork. And so I think we got, you know, I think teamwork's important and there we go. Um, but yeah, I, like these, I was not familiar with that you have this post interview process as well. So that's, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And that seems both an effective methodology, but also one that would be compelling to a field that uses that kind of methodology, right? So, I mean, that, that seems like a very good fit for classics as someone who doesn't, doesn't know how these kinds of things work at all. But that seems like something that uh, an audience of, of philologists and linguists and archaeologists and things would, would find compelling. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, upon skimming through my professor, my qualitative professor's book, um, it very much struck me as the kind of book an ancient historian would write if they had access to their sources, like if their sources weren't all dead. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is the dream of like, man, what if I could just like ask a couple questions? <laughs> I just would like to know what Sophocles thought this word was doing because I, I have eight pages on what I think it's doing, but it'd be great to know what he thought he was doing. Can I say, since I now have this, this position to say so, uh, I, I would like to think uh, in a kind of fun twist of fate that all of the authors who we'd like to ask what words meant, like half of the time they would be like, I don't know, I just picked a word. Uh, I wish I'd picked a better one. Like, I would really like to think that that's the case, but I know that's a little, a little cynical of me. But. I mean, there is absolutely a point where like, the amount that I'm reading into this passage, like, that might not be. <laughs> I'm putting a lot of weight on this line that like, I don't know if Sophocles was thinking about that one thing that Euripides wrote and like, it, it could just be a word that they both liked. Um, but, you know, I'm way to undermine all of my research, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, it undermines the entire field, but that's why we try not to think about it too much. Yeah. Let's... <laughs> We all agreed that the, we have the death of the author and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what they mm -hmm. thought. So we're good. It doesn't, <laughs> this, this time travel scenario doesn't hurt anybody. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess like my, my sort of the follow-up question. So in terms of, of what kinds of questions can we ask? Um, I guess my, my follow-up question is, so like, let's say we, we actually get some useful findings. We, you do qualitative, you do interviews, you get some, you get some really like, good meaty stuff, how does that descent, like, do we just hope that something that's going great at North Carolina and the SES writes up a thing about how great it's going at North Carolina, what if, I don't know, USC doesn't, like, they're like, that, that's not for us. We, we think it's very important that, and, and this, this was a big fight, I don't know, a year, 18 years ago at the time. I, sometime there was a big fight on the internet about um, whether you can do classics without the languages, right? Can you, like, yeah. can you, are, is classical civilization majors and classes, like, is that really classics? And um, I could, I could very much see some institutions saying, like, we had great results by expanding our classical civ offerings. And it was, it was, it brought people into the classroom. It was wonderful. Um, it really, like we got new, you know, we started cross-listing with departments that are doing like film studies and critical race and ethnic studies. And it, it just brought a whole interesting new group of students into the classics classroom and a lot of them became majors and it was, it was beautiful. And some schools saying like, okay, but we're not going to do that. We are like languages, languages are what we do. Um, how, even if we get these kind of numbers, is there any mechanism or do you have ideas about whether that is something like, can the SCS, does making a statement get results? Uh, does, you know, putting out a press release of like, we really think this is some good best practices. Does that actually change anything? Because I feel like that's a lot of I, thinking about kind of grad programs and how grad programs are run. There are so many differences from institution to institution. And it, some places 
things seem to be going great and people are getting good training and they're exploring all that stuff. And there's, there's really a lot of progress around grad training and it hasn't, it hasn't spread to other schools. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of seems like the, the last barrier of like, even, even if we, we do some really great studies, do you, do you see them that being implemented? Do we just hope everyone will be so excited about these findings that they will un critically just like, yes, absolutely, bring it all in and we'll, we'll make these changes or, or not? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm really thankful for this question um, because it, it brings up a lot of things that, um, that I would really, one of the magical wand things that I really wanted people to kind of get from this sort of, sort of thing. Let's say that in our little SCS den of, you know, thousands of employees and uh, infinite funding and uh, uh, perfectly uh, dedicated uh, everybody. Um, we come up with the perfect question we want to ask about the field. It's specific. It'll lead to um, measurable change. Uh, we do all the research. We get the information. Um, we disseminate it. Um, unless it has to do with SES membership, the SES can do very, on its own, can do very little. We, uh, this is one of the things that anybody who's um, kind of been in the placement service, um, I think understandably, um, but is also, also justifiably upset about, which is that, you know, say an organization posts uh, an ad, or, or a university specifically posts an ad, it's a 4-4 teaching load. It's an adjunct position. Uh, and they put in the ad, we're probably going to pay about 2000 bucks for this 4-4. Um, and, uh, you know, um, better be ready to move. And uh, we're not doing relocation. Um, that ad comes in, I'm posting it. Um, and a lot of people will think SES shouldn't post that, or they should tell the department to offer or do a smaller course load or offer more money. SES can't tell that department to do anything. We can't. Uh, we, can, we can deny them posting the ad if they don't say that they're an equal opportunity employer, for example, because that's federally required. Um, but the amount to which SES can come to your department and do a thing is minimal to non-existent. Um, and in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, that's very good um, because I can't think of a lot of departments that would want the SES to do that. Um, and a lot of a lot of ways that that could be very bad. Um, but there are a lot of things that departments can do with the SES press releases, data, that there, most of them, if I'm not gonna say all of them, but most of them aren't currently doing. So for example, hypothetical situation, let's say the SES came out with the press release approved, which is, you know, let's say it's approved by the board, like it is, Full of the, it is through all of the administrative channels. It is official SCS policy that, uh, let's think of something absurd so I don't accidentally hit too close to home on something, <laughs> um, that all classics departments need to have two amphorae right up, right up in the front desk, right? Um, it's got to, they got to be at least two feet tall. Um, and they've got to be originals. Uh, not sure how we get them, uh, <laughs> but it's got to be there. Um, current Under the current system of how SES does things and departments respond, 80% um, of departments aren't going to do that. 10% um, of the departments are going to ask for the money to do it through some, through some institutional uh, methodology and get denied. Um, and another 10 are going to go steal those amphorae because they can't be bothered to email their department or their, uh, their humanities chair. Can't blame them. The humanities chairs get more emails than the department chairs. And that shouldn't be physically possible, but it happens. Um, what a professional society like the SES is really good for and is rarely utilized for is when they put, when we put out a statement like that, that is approved by our board, and we are the only national organization for classics, international organization for classics, as a matter of fact, um, that carries a lot of weight 
with a lot of university administrators who aren't just your humanities chair. Um, going to a, something a little more realistic than to Ampri, going to, going to your uh, dean, like let's say dean of the humanities, if you're in a university with multiple schools, provost of that school, vice provost with student affairs of that school, um, and if you feel like you got the leverage, your HR department, um, and saying, my national organization says I can't hire somebody part-time for a 4-4 teaching loan. Can't do it. National organization says so. That actually carries a lot of administrative weight. And mm, if okay. you were to, in combination, ask us to write it down again in a letter on some letterhead, which bureaucracy loves letterhead, um, <laughs> you can. I have never ceased to be amazed that people care about letterhead. That is such a, they, I don't know if it's a generational they, thing or what, but. You laugh, but they care a lot. Yeah. Like, no, I've, I've noticed letters, like letters of recommendation need to be on letterhead for some reason as though that changes anything about it. As if it matters, but it matters to some people. And you'd be, you'd be very surprised at how far that gets you. Not all departments are the same. Not all deans are the same. There are some legitimately awful deans out there who you could show them, you know, that the president of the United States and NATO came together and said, you need to hire an extra classicist this year, and they're not going to listen, right? <laughs> but by and large, administrators care about it, other administrations, and that's what SCS is. It's an administrative body looking after classicists. It's not as strong as something like a union, for example but it's in the same ballpark. So if we start to do this research, qualitative research that has recommendations, that is approved by the board, that goes through our administrative channels, preferably goes through a committee and has multiple names on it and has things that are praxis that actually work in a department, taking that to the correct channels and working it through that particular kind of way can actually be more effective than people think. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's that's not something that is widely known. Um, because so yeah, I mean, I think and and I, that's that feels like an underutilized tool on a lot of fronts in terms of potentially even at the department level of having things that you know if the SCS has best practices for something, if being able to say, um, I know you and I have talked previously about, you know, if, if there were recommendations for grad programs should do X, mm -hmm. even, you know, just being able to go to the chair, going to the director of graduate studies and saying like, we're not getting professionalism training. No one's ever told us how to do a practice. Like we've never had a practice interview. The SCS says we should be doing that. Could we do that? Um, you know, I think that that is a, an, an underutilized way to kind of use an appeal to authority and say like, you know, I, this isn't my idea. I'm not rabble rousing here. The, the SCS has said we should do this. Could we start doing this here? I think is, is a place where just because the SCS can't um, wave a wand and make things happen or make departments listen, I, I do think being able to at least point to that and say like, just an honest question, why aren't we doing the thing that our organization says we should be doing? Yeah. And, and that's something that where the feedback loop between SCS members and the SCS can work in the opposite direction. Um, for example, um, if somebody were to, were to come to us, and this happens sometimes, uh, and they say, my administration is really hostile towards, um, uh, what's, what's a good example? Um, towards uh, something that doesn't exist anymore, so I'll use it as an example, really hostile towards translation-based dissertations, right? Back in the day, you used to be able to get a classics degree by translating a work, and you would have to comment on it, and there would be some, some scholarship back and forth, but the bulk of this dissertation would be translation-based. Um, if, if a classicist were to come to us and say, um, I have three grad students this year who want to do dissertations based on translation, like we used to do back in the old days, could the SCS maybe um, consider a public statement, which is what it would be called, um, uh, supporting this sort of action? Because my dean says translation-based dissertations uh, don't make sense because 
and you know, the classics chair knows that that dean is thinking of like modern languages, right? Uh, it, it it feels weird to be doing a translation dissertation for a modern language, but for a dead language, you know, we haven't translated all of Galen, and my my department wants to translate some Galen. Uh, it's a valuable contribution to the field. Let's make it a dissertation. Um, if the SDS makes a public statement on that, then that administrator or that faculty member who came to us can then take that public statement back to the dean and say, hey, look, this international organization that claims to represent and has the kind of gravitas to represent the entire field in this country uh, says that these dissertations are actually good and we've done them before and they're valuable contributions to the field, you should allow them. Um, that matters. Yeah, that's, I remember when we, when we last talked about this, uh, you know, it was, it was something where I was like, I, I just never considered that that was, a, <laughs> that was a, a role that the SDS can play because I think, especially for, this was, I, you know, I was, I was on the job market and feeling like there, there was a lot of, I had a lot of frustration around like, can the SCS do anything? <laughs> like, why, why can't they fix more things? Um, and, you know, it, it seems like the, the best they can offer is a, a slap on the wrist if someone breaks a rule or whatever. Um, and yeah, when you kind of mentioned that it does, it holds weight, not even if it doesn't necessarily hold weight with making an individual person in the field behave differently, it carries weight with administrators and with other, you know, sort of organizations. And so that, you know, the kind of the statement can be a powerful tool for getting things done kind of within a, a broader institution. So um, no, I'm glad, I'm glad that came up because <laughs> I think that was something that I just had no, that, that wasn't even on my radar as a thing that the SCS could do. Yeah, I, I know we're covering old ground here. The people of um, people well, of no. YouTube are, are getting a, a, a glimpse into the conversation <laughs> you and I have had privately for the last two years at the at the annual meeting, late into the night. Um, yeah, but um, to be to be fair, these are like useful. I remember after some of the, the times yeah. we've talked about stuff, I was, I was like, oh my God, you guys, I just learned so much about the SCS. <laughs> so, um, well, and, you know. and some other thing is like, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt if you're, no, if you're in the middle of a thought. No, I was, I was trailing off. Okay. Um, just as a matter of, uh, a matter of course, for example, with the placement service in particular, um, you know, nobody's got to tell me that, that jo the job market out there in classes for classes is bad. You know, I, I, I see it, um, firsthand and in terms of, you know, enforcement of bad behavior, it, it feels as a candidate, and I can I can say this to somebody who is like publicly also now that I have my master's looking for another job and is also on a different kind of job market, um, it feels ineffective. It feels um, uh, like it's not it's not powerful enough for the SCS to do anything if somebody is a bad actor. But by the same vein of what we were just talking about, if I'm going to make up, let's pretend. I'm I'm trying so hard not to like call out like states, <laughs> like entire state. Let's let's say Canada's a state. Um, and it's not like Canada, it's like a 51st state somewhere situated somewhere near, you know, Iowa. Uh let's say let's say Canada um uh behaves badly in their interview. They like um they ask if a candidate is pregnant, and then in the next interview they um, half of the committee picks their nose and then kind of like flicks boogers at the neck at the candidate. Uh, <laughs> and then the one after that, uh, says, you know, um, we're not going to pay you. Uh, we're just going to kind of give you mice, um, and, uh, hope that that's payment enough. Um, and the, all the, all the candidates come and they report this to the SCS and like, okay, here's what we'll do. We, we can't allow Canada to post job ads anymore. Right. That feels to those candidates useless because yeah. the grievance that they experienced was not addressed. Um, they feel hurt by the situation and they ended up with no job, right? That is extremely unsatisfying for all those candidates. And I, as I personally understand why. Um, and they could say, well, why can't you make them pay money or take them to jail? Uh, and I will have to force say, them to give me a job <laughs> right now at this apparently right. terrible department. But nonetheless, right, right. Uh, and I'll no, say, and I mean, you know, I think this is. Oh, sorry, yes, I yes. like this is exactly the frustration that I think it started. I was talking about, of like, uh -huh, if uh -huh. if someone does something they're not supposed to do, 
they can't post their job on the placement service? Like, is that even a punishment? They're still going to get well, applications. The job market is bad enough. They're still going to get a million people applying for the job. Does it hurt them at all? Well, here's the thing. Um, first off, like to, to finish my thought, uh, the SES is not a police state. Uh, we, do, we are not the FBI. <laughs> um, I cannot do enough push-ups to be a member of the FBI. Um, <laughs> well, not with so that I attitude, not, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I could not go to Canada with handcuffs and take that department into arrest. Um, but if, in addition to not being able to let them post ads, I, the pr sole proprietor of the placement service, go to the humanities dean at the University of Canada and say, I am blocking your university from placing ads with us because of this behavior. Uh, that dean is suddenly in deep trouble. And that dean is suddenly calling about five lawyers to make sure that um, there are not suits filed against them. Uh, they're probably not gonna let University of Canada have another hire anyway, if they don't cancel the search that they just had. Um, they might defund the department. Um, the, the department actually becomes in a lot of trouble uh, in ways that candidates don't feel and get no recompense for, but do affect the actual institution. Now, that gets undercut, uh, for example, and I'm not saying that this is a universally bad thing, but it doesn't help when the University of Canada can then just post their job on, in, on the uh, Institute for, or, um, what's it called, Inside Higher Ed, or on whatever version of FAMA I will lend exists now. Um, if University of Iowa can actually just throw that job somewhere else and know that they're going to get applicants anyway, that actually diminishes our ability to actually punish them in ways that we are able to. Um, right. But again, in none of those scenarios do the candidates end up feeling better. Um, because the things that we could do to make candidates feel better, like create jobs out of nowhere or uh, put people into jail, we can't do those things. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that is a big a big source of frustration. And you know, this, this is has nothing to do with data anymore. But since we're on the topic, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, you know uh, yeah. <laughs> this is, I'm sure there's data somewhere involved in this. But you know, when, you, when we went back to talking about people actually reporting things, you know, I mean, I I will say almost everyone I talked to on the job market, like about what do you do if they ask about something they're not allowed to, and the advice from a lot of faculty members was like, well, you go report them to the placement service. I'm like, okay. So now they know that I'm a troublemaker. Now they know that like, and I don't get a next stage interview. I can't prove that's why. I can't prove that's retaliation. And so I think that that is an entirely separate conversation. But I, you know, I think that does get to this question of like, you're not going to get everything reported because they interviewed 10 people and they only asked one person about if they were planning to have kids or if they're pregnant or if they're whatever, um, there's going to be, there will be a complaint and that person for, you know, they just didn't get it. I mean, people get, don't get next round interviews for a million reasons. I, I would never be able to prove that it was because I was being retaliated against for reporting something. And so I think, I don't know anyone who had a bad experience in an interview and reported it because what does it get you? It, gets you no job and a lower chance of having a job in the future. Whereas, um, I don't know, I was talking to some grad students about like, on the one hand, sure, do you want to work somewhere where there are bad actors? Ideally, no. But if that's the only job, I don't know, for a year, I can put up with having bad colleagues for a year if it means I have a job and I can pay my rent and I have a chance, to, you know, I have one more year to try and get that tenure track position. So that feels like a whole separate institutional kind of, of issue. But I think because of the smallness of the field, the same reasons people aren't going to put specific complaints about sexual harassment, about uh, racism, about all of these different things in any formal capacity, because it's going to be very easy to figure out who it is. Yeah, absolutely. But no, no, that was just a window into other conversations you and I have had. <laughs> for people who, the, <laughs> yes. the best of Amy and Eric talking about things. Um, Listen, but, I, I, we've had we've had superb conversations that were not recorded, so I'm actually pretty happy we're getting them on getting it on tape. Yeah, at least now we're we're rehashing <laughs> some of the greatest hits. This is sort of the yeah. the free bird of our conversations. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to the actual, I, I uh -huh. think um, I think that I am actually sort of unless there are things that you want to cover, I think I I feel like my big questions have sort of been 
addressed and the big, the arguments that I see people putting forward about like, you know, the, the SCS should, uh, mm-hmm. I think, I think we've addressed a lot of them. Are there things that you wanted to, to make sure we talked about that we haven't yet? Uh, I, we've covered most of my things. My, my big takeaway, I kind of put a nice, I, I have my own, my own notes on our, our combo here, but I made pre pre conversation. Uh, cause once I got copy in me, who knows what comes out, um, <laughs> as we've seen. Um, but, uh, my, my big recommendation, um, to people, and I know it's not satisfying, um, but it's the way that I work as a person, uh, is, um, is very policy oriented, uh, as, as somebody who, who has had his share of activism, um, I find satisfaction out of a lot of things, uh, that, that involve in those circles. But when I want to see change, I go to I go to things like policy, um, and to um, institutional change. It's just part of my way. Um, if if people want to take away from this conversation, I think the best place to start is that when we're talking about data, or when we're talking about what we want as a field, we need to start with better questions. Um, I think that. We have a very broad, important, uncomfortable, but good conversation going on fieldwide now, um, particularly about race and white supremacy, um, but about other things like job diversity, um, uh, you know, first gen, other things. Um, that's all very well and good. But when I get an email uh, saying, do better, um, I need a little more (laughs) to work with. I personally, and I do do this, um, I I think I mentioned this, I wrote a piece for the SES newsletter or the blog or, um, no, it was the blog, I was interviewed for the blog. And uh, I I mentioned that I stare at the wall sometimes in the office for a couple hours. And uh, that's how most of the big things I've done for the society, like restarting the newsletter have even happened is I stared at the wall for two hours and (laughs) came up with a thing. I personally could sit at the sit and stare at the wall for two hours and say, a really good question that we could answer about our field that's specific and that I could actually go out and do research on um, is X. And that's all well and good. And maybe some people will find that useful. But if you personally want to see X changed or Y changed or Z changed in the field, if you come to me with a very good specific question that I can then give to a committee and suddenly we have eight people thinking about it. And then that committee can give a memo to the SDS office demanding that we, we look into it um, because that is the purpose of the SDS office is to execute the will of the committee and its members um, or the SES board and its membership. Um, that's even better because then I know that the SES office time is being spent answering these questions and being and it's being productive at the same time right so, so i guess that's, a, that's kind of my takeaway yeah go ahead yeah no i now have a follow-up to the well Ready. this will never this will never <laughs> conclude i have I, it's like a hydra i have more questions we've only on done two hours i got another yeah, three I mean, hours is, in me on this <laughs> <laughs> i'm coffeeed up i'm ready to go um so for i mean just in terms of thinking about people who I think a lot of the the strongest, most enthusiastic, most whatever push for change in the field right now is coming from a lot of junior members, a lot of grad students, mm-hmm. a lot of people who are both um, frustrated with a lot of things and, and have a lot of energy to push for, for things to be different. Um, for people, you know, it, it seems most people on committees are more senior folks. Um, I, I would guess, I don't know if this is factually true. I would guess it's, um, like our ones are, are probably overrepresented in terms of the number of classic students in the country. I think, I think kind of the bigger institutions, uh, are, are holding more sway in, in those committees for a grad student, for a contingent faculty member, for some, like, is coming to you with a question, is going directly to a committee member? Do you look up what committee seems appropriate on the website and email those people out of the blue? Like what, what actual practical steps? Because I think in terms of, you know, you're talking about advocating for policy change, structural change, um, 
what does that actually look like? Is that, is that tweeting into the void? Is that calling and leaving an angry voicemail for you? Is that emailing the people directly? What, what actual steps would you recommend if people do have issues they want to see, like specific questions? They thought about it, they've talked to all stakeholders in the question, they have a really good question that they want to, to see drive data collection. Mm -hmm. What next? Uh, uh, first off, I, I recommend since, uh, you know, typically when we're talking about the people who the policies affect the most, uh, they have the least amount of time because uh, if they're a grad student, for example, they're working another job. Like, let's, let's kind of get out of the, let's, I, I'm really sick and tired of us pretending that grad students are walking around with their stipends and not working elsewhere. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know how you, you mean we, you mean they're not living that cushy <laughs> life on eight hundred dollars uh, a month that <laughs> I, I swear it was this year I saw somebody it was a faculty member and I'm not gonna say who they are um was talking to me in, in e an email thread and we were having this disagreement and I was like what is at the core of this disagreement and there was this under this lack of understanding like that their grad students were only doing one thing and I'm like oh you just don't you don't know that your grad <laughs> students are are working elsewhere, do you? Like, you just don't know. And I'm like, okay, I gotta, we gotta reel back an entire conversation because uh, you're wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure there is, uh, there is a general sense that like, oh no, grad students are full-time doing their research and, you know, teach. I mean, I guess that they have to spend some time on their teaching, they can do that, but it's like, they're mostly a full-time researcher. Like, no, they are not. No, they are not picking so up side gigs every which way because, a, a grad student stipend by and large, if maybe you can live on it with no emergencies, but the yeah. second your car breaks or you have a medical emergency, like it, it's, you know, yeah, yeah. a lot, lot, lot mean, of grad students are not full-time grad students. No, for context, uh, when I was a full-time grad student at UCLA and didn't have a side gig, um, the place that I could afford was riddled with bed bugs. Um, and that's just the nice. way that I lived for a year. Uh, so give you some context. Um, and the same obviously goes for adjuncts. So I, I bring all this up to, to make the point of, please, for the love of God, don't go to the SCS website and try to figure out which committee is important. That's not worth your time. Um, it is, um, I would also recommend not tweeting to the void. Uh, in general, um, tweets to the void don't get to me. Tweets to the SCS account do get to me. And um, generally the context is more hostile than you imagine it being. Um, uh, if I am, for example, just getting off of a, off of an email thread about some very complicated and expensive part of the annual meeting that I have to wrap my head around and I get a tweet that says the SCS should, uh, I don't take that as a genuine attempt to engage the SCS. I take that as a, um, you were on Twitter and you had a feeling. Um, and that's really good. I, I am also on Twitter and have feelings and tweet at people <laughs> who I don't expect to respond to me in good faith. Um, but I would say your best route of action is to approach somebody who you trust, who has more um, economic and field security than you um, to make them do the work uh, because they should be doing it uh, for you. All else fails. Um, if you really really feel like you can engage at this level, email info, uh, just the general info at classicalstudies.org or me directly and say, hey, I have this idea or I have this thought or I have this question I want answered. How do I do it? Um, I get so few of those emails. I, I can't understate how much I don't get emails that I could easily answer. Um, and uh, or easily start to like turn into a project. Like you emailing me and saying, I have this really interesting question about classics that I think people would want to know about. That makes me look good in my job. Uh, and that's <laughs> something that I would want to work on because it has my self-interest involved, right? This is a basic tenet of organizing. Put, put your stakes and my stakes together right. and we got action. So um, do as little work as possible <laughs> um, to get that information to the people who can make, who can make change. Um, and then make sure that you follow up and keep it accountable. Um, those are the two steps that I would, I would recommend most. Awesome. Well, I think, 
I don't know. I like the idea of ending with some, we got some concrete action steps. I think that's always concrete a good place to end steps. discussions of like, <laughs> okay, we, we talked about a lot of stuff. What are we doing? What's our next step? What are we going from here? So I think, I think mm -hmm. that might be a good place to, to wrap up. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amy, for yeah, allowing thank me you for to doing turn this. A, oh yeah. I mean, you allowed me to turn a fresh, <laughs> we talk about Twitter. I was just frustratingly tweeting a feeling of, um, you know, generally when I talk about classics on Twitter, I try to couch my words a little bit, but, um, you know, uh, you, you turned a very, a very, um, kind of bad faith tweet into a productive conversation. And I appreciate yeah, it. No, I, yeah. I think this is, I mean, I think these are conversations that, um, and I, I, because I assume most people won't take me up on this, I would highly recommend that anybody, uh, open up a conversation with Eric. I, I, I have learned so much about so many things from having conversations with you at the SCS and, and elsewhere. So, um, you know, I think uh, as long as as long as you are still with the SCS, uh, I would I would recommend. Um, you know, Eric is is such a, a force for trying to trying to help and trying to make uh, make the field a, a better, more equitable, more compassionate place. So, um, you know, hopefully the next meeting there won't be like thirty people just mobbing you asking all of their questions. But I would highly recommend that anybody. Uh, That'd be great. <laughs> you know, uh, open open up conversations with with Eric because he is he has been such a a good advocate for like who do I talk to about this or what why is this thing the way it is um you know been a, been a good person to to ask these things of so just as a, a quick plug for Eric is awesome everyone go bug him with all of your questions all the time as long as they're nice Amy uh, I couldn't be more thankful. Um, you you take too much of your of your time to go just out of the above and beyond. So, um, it's uh it is literally my job to do this. So please <laughs> please come do this. Uh, bring bring this stuff to me. Great. Well, have a good rest of your day, Eric. This was this was wonderful. Yeah. And yeah, we'll be in touch about stuff going forward. But um, I think I think two plus hours is probably <laughs> probably a good place to leave this. <laughs>